Hi, fans. Hi, Duck. Duck. I'm here. Tomorrow. Yes. Uh, we are Duck. Um, we prepare to start about two minutes. We will start. And uh, I, I only say a few words to introduce you. So after that, you start. And I think uh, uh, two minutes more, we will start. To meet more, we will start. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Should turn off. Turn off the mic. Dear President, by the book, how are you? How are you? Hello, Hello. 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 Wonderful. Oh. See you. So we, we prepare to start. Yes. A minute more. We will start. This is a new. I don't see where I have my mic and where I am. I'm there. I'm we, can, we can hear you very well. Oh, no. Maybe. Where? Can I leave call? What? No, you're no. wrong. No, you wait, wait to turn my mic on and off. Oh, yeah, I don't see it. This, that. Or not. It's off. It's on. It's on. Yeah. We start. Yeah. It's on. Okay. Hi, Doc. Yes, Doc. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. Now, yeah. Now we start. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your joining us. Uh, today we are very glad to introduce Doug Franz. He is a, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and former Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Grant served as Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs in the Obama Administration. 
He was an investigative reporter for the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and the New York Times. We are honored to introduce Doug Trump. He is a moderator for AI International Accord panel today. Thank you so much. Bob. Thank you very much, Tuan, and thanks to everyone for coming this morning. I see on the sign up, my old boss, Andy Wyckoff is on here. So uh, if he chimes in at some point, we should take whatever Andy says very seriously. Um, I'm going to just introduce the panelists very quickly. Most of you know each other. Um, and we have we have a, a long agenda here, a lot to discuss. So first, Governor Michael Dukakis, thank, thank you very Nama much. Shukri of MIT. She's one of the world's really leading thinkers on the nexus between international relations and cyber politics. Your writing, teaching, and vision on the necessity of international cooperation as the world learns to deal with this new cyber reality will be critical to developing an accord that allows us to harness AI systems for the common good. Um, Minister Yasuhide Nakayama is the State Minister for Defense in the Japanese cabinet. His work at the pinnacle of foreign affairs provides a critical perspective as we move forward in creating an accord that will unite disparate political and economic interests. The minister comes from a distinguished family of politicians, and perhaps most notably, your grandmother, Masa Nakayama, was the first woman to serve in the Japanese cabinet. I find that to be fascinating and, and incredibly laudatory. Um, next is President Vera Vic Freiberger. She was the first, you were the first president of Latvia, one of my favorite countries, I must say. You were instrumental in bringing Latvia to a position of global influence by ushering the country into the European Union and NATO. And your ongoing work with international organizations, the longest list I've ever seen, and Latvia's leadership on artificial intelligence issues bring us a voice of unsurpassed experience and influence. Professor Dr. Zlatko Lagumicia was the Prime Minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina and held about just about every other post in the government there. Your work on management and information technologies as a professor at the University of Sarajevo provides a strong foundation. We work to draft work on artificial intelligence issues. If people can mute while you're not talking, um, that would really be helpful. And our final speaker will be Mayor of Hickok, who is here to ensure that we don't make any mistakes. She's a consultant and a lecturer on AI ethics and a leader of the Women in AI Ethics Collective, which is a group of truly outstanding young minds and a great resource for us. You're also, she's also an expert in privacy and data security, two of the topics that we must grapple with in the coming months if we're to establish legitimacy. So with those brief introductions, I'd like to turn this over to our first speaker, Governor Dukakis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. Thanks very much. I'll try to be as brief as I possibly can because we've got lots to do and some awfully good people to help us do it. Um, first, my thanks to all of you for being part of this. Um, the United States has come through a very difficult four years under the Trump administration. Uh, I'm delighted to say that he's gone, I hope, permanently. and. Uh, I have great confidence in Joe Biden's ability to work with us and work with you and uh, rekindle a lot of the spirit of collaboration, which I think we had uh, before Trump took over. And uh, I noticed uh, just this morning that uh, the Biden administration is already actively working with the original team that negotiated our agreement on uh, nuclear with uh, Iran. Um, I hope we're getting back to that in a hurry, and I hope that's a sign of uh, a, a new approach or 
more more accurately uh, a return to the old, old approach before the Trump administration took over. Um, I am a very strong believer in international collaboration. That's one of the reasons why um, I and so many of us have been part of this effort. And uh, just thank you all for, for being uh, important pieces of it. And uh, I hope helping us to return to a spirit of international collaboration, which includes, which includes some countries that may not agree with us on everything, but uh, are anxious to work on many of the important issues that we face. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this when it comes to China, but I must say to you that I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing uh, happening in uh, the United States or what has happened over the past four years. Uh, I don't know what it is that uh, convinces some people in this country that we must have an enemy someplace. Uh, but uh, I'm not a fan of enemies. I'm a fan of strong international collaboration, and especially when it comes to AI and the issues that we hope, with your help and support, we can work on over the course of this year. Um, but uh, we've got too many other things to deal with that are important to get involved in another Cold War. And uh, one of the things that I hope our work as part of this effort, your work, will help us to do is to uh, move away from that and more aggressively toward uh, a spirit of international collaboration, which at least looks at many issues on which we generally agree internationally and works hard to develop a spirit of collaboration and uh, and good uh, and and good uh, and 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 good relationships which can in fact uh, achieve much uh, over the course of the coming year in our work with all of you in any event uh, I'm delighted to be part of this. I'm delighted the Boston Global Forum is part of it. And I thank you all very much for participating actively in this. Um, there's nothing more important than trying to create a world in which uh, we collaborate peacefully and constructively together and try to avoid uh, what we went through, many of us, for so many years with the Cold War. Um, we don't need that again. What we need is uh, close and collaborative work uh, to uh, move this world of ours uh, as, as strongly as we can uh, toward an era where we, we work together, we uh, collaborate together, uh, we identify areas of, of common concern and we, we go to work on them and, and uh, how we deal with AI uh, and our work with all of you <clears throat> is an important part of that. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for, for joining us and for um, participating. Uh, there's nothing more important and uh, I feel a lot more optimistic, needless to say, today than I did a year ago. Uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of, of Joe Biden's and uh, the team that he has put together. And uh, I hope very much the United States will resume its position as a peacemaker, not a war maker, um, and, uh, and work with all of us to, uh, to achieve that end. In any event, uh, special thanks to Tuan for being the person that really helped us to put all of this together and to all of you for the work that you're doing and will be doing as we um, see if we can't get AI constructively under control and, uh, and make sure it does good things, not bad things. And that's always a danger. In any event, Tuan, thank you. Thank, thank all of you. Uh, it's good to, uh, to see you all, and it's great to work with you to achieve some important ends. So thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Dukakis. I think 
your repetition of the word collaboration is necessary. Um, that that is that's really the key here. It's going to be it's going to be very difficult. I was at the State Department working for Secretary Kerry when he negotiated the Iran nuclear accord, and um, that was tough. But I think an international accord on artificial intelligence will be just as difficult. So we've got such a great group oh. here. Um, Thank you. I, I, I trained him in his youth when he was my lieutenant governor, so uh, I appreciate those <laughs> those good words. Job. You did a fine job. And Wendy Sherman was my was my coordinator in the state of Maryland in the 1988 campaign. So got some good people to work with. That's for sure. Um, all right, um, Professor Shokri, um, you're up. Thank you. Um, if I exceed my time, feel free to cut me off but I'll try not to. There are three points I'd like to, to share with you. The first has to do with the challenges. We all know the challenges, but there's some aspects that we have to focus on more than others. And then I'll follow this up with a focus uh, on opportunities. And then finally, I'll, I'll end up with the imperatives. What are the critical imperatives right now? So on the challenges, we all know that technology and innovation is growing much faster rate than our ability to manage, to regulate, uh, and, to, uh, and to anticipate. Of course, we don't want regulations to operate at the time frame of technological changes. Of course we don't. We want some, some form of, of, of stability. So the, uh, one of the challenges is how to establish stable principles and processes in, the, in a context that is rapidly, rapidly uh, changing. Related to this on the challenges is that in the old days, it was just governments that counted. And now it's governments and the private sector in this area. And one of the experiments we work, we are living now is the, the, the Facebook Australia relationship. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens there. But we have to remember that in the AI world, that lots of other players, individuals, me and me, uh, groups, not from not-for-profit entities, um, the fact of anonymity, uh, it doesn't take much to disrupt. Any MIT undergraduate with introduction to AI or advanced AI can really do a lot of uh, damage for the rest of us. So, in, in some ways, um, we have to remember that there's an AI relationship with the human being. AI relationship with the brain, the brain and the AI, and it's, it's very dicey to think about that, that aspect of it. Uh, and then AI and AI, and then I would ask you how much of this do you think we are in control of or can be in control of? Now, that's the, the, the challenges, opportunities. And here I feel much more comfortable. Um, on the opportunities, the international community has had a long and effective record uh, of framing and reaching agreements on a whole range of issues, uh, none of which are easy. We know that. Um, uh, we know that we can do standards, quality control, certifications, etc. What we don't know, and it's an opportunity now to really figure it out, what works best when, um, how and, and, and why. The, the situations are very different in every domain. So, from, from a strictly academic point of view, to do the background for the pragmatics, just sorting out what has worked well, when, and how. Related to this is that we tend to react, react after the fact. When the problem is there, we all see it, we say, aha, problem. This is a situation where we have an opportunity to really recognize a challenge and its multifacets uh, early on. And of course, we have neglected to focus on, on the ethics of AI. So I'm very pleased that we will be doing that. Um, and I, I would very much like every course in every university everywhere to have a module on the ethics. Um, I'm not even sure that MIT has that, although we've been pushing for it. The, uh, the, the last really opportunity we have, a really good one, is that the political contentions, the lines of cleavages uh, on the AI domain internationally have not yet been drawn. We don't have the good guys, the bad guys, etc., etc. It's still fluid. 
And this fluidity can give us opportunities to transform potentials for cleavages into strategies for, for cooperation. Now, let me, let me move on and finish up with, with imperatives. Um, at this point, it's clear that governments um, do not really control the AI domain. Much of the players is, are in the private sector. Uh, and what we have here is a set of constituencies and their consensus in whatever direction the, the, the um, accord takes uh, is essential. It's absolutely imperative. It's not, not like the nuclear world. It might be more like the environmental world, uh, but it's much more pressing uh, than, the, than the environmental world in terms of having to take into account the concerns and interests of all the participants in, 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 in the AI. And unfortunately, uh, they and me are not the direct participants. I would say that the undergraduate at MIT are going to be more so than we, we have been. So we have to keep that into, into my, in, in, in mind. And the dilemma we have, uh, the imperatives we have to worry about is how to do that without dampening innovation, without controlling um, markets in that area, without dampening and without uh, indicating that we are going to punish innovation. That, that won't fly. So my conclusion is this. The, the most immediate path to take uh, and I, I guess I'll give credit to where my conclusion comes from before I tell you what it is. It comes from the note that uh, Doug sent around, the very last point on his, on his set of observation, just um, through the fact that we really have to begin to take into account uh, and connect with, especially connect with other constituencies that, like us, are trying to uh, to respond to the AI realities. So we have no alternative but to think of establishing a multi-stakeholder support system for this initiative. And I think that this is really important before, or during, but certainly before we begin to work out the, the very, the very uh, details. And with that, I would say thank you for, for giving me the time to share my thoughts with you. Voila. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think that you, you've given us a good tour of both the challenges and the opportunities. And I think especially the, the point about the necessity of including other multi-stake, multi-stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the inclusion part of this is what will give us credibility. <clears throat> and, you know, we don't have it yet. This is a very, a very new group and and we need we need to be think think about how to make this effort more inclusive going forward it was one of the problems we had at the oecd um, we managed to get around it when we came up with develop the principles there as as andy will remember by by having at the table by having um, union, uh, unions there by having the business community there by having outside groups so it's something that we need to think about i think going forward um, now, let me uh, quickly turn to Minister Nakayama, who has very graciously stayed up late to be with us. And we appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Fransan. Good morning, good afternoon, good, e good evening, and good night. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, uh, Yasuhide Nakayama. It's an honor to be invited back to the Boston Global Forum. Right. And uh, I'm always respect uh, Dukaki's yeah. son. Uh, very respectable speech at the beginning of this uh, great occasion. Thank you very much. And also Chan San, who is uh, my Asian friend, and uh, he invited me tonight. So I thank you, Tsang Tsang. And uh, I, I'd like to talk about AI uh, in seven minutes. So AI has become uh, indispensable technology in various fields, including in the manufacturing industry. 
and the medical, agriculture, and the financial sectors with the development of civilian technology. However, scientific developments can also present new challenges to national security. In many countries, the use of AI has led to the development of new military technologies, such as drone swarm, and also renewed information warfare threats, such as uh, dissemination of fake news. There has been active discussions in the international community about the need to establish certain ethical principles for the use of AI. As for AI ethics, social principle of human-centric AI was de developed as a guidance. Uh, it, it stipulates principles related issues. A social principle of human-centric AI consists of seven principles, including human-centric principle that respects basic human rights guaranteed by domest domestic laws and the international norms, and the principle of ensuring security, which addresses security risks associated elements of AI policy observatory of results obtained from AI operations. Japan Military of Defense, Minister of Defense, MOD, and the Self-Defense Forces are still, uh, honestly speaking, in the uh, primary, primary stage of collecting information for the development of ethic uh, regarding AI. Uh, however, we believe that evaluations and judgments on the use of AI will follow Japan's social principle of human-centric AI and international norms, as I mentioned. Uh, at, the, at, at that time, we are based on the social principle of human-centric AI. It is also necessary to consider that the systems need functions to detect and avoid uh, uni, uh, unintended uh, consequ consequences and to shut down or suspend the systems that have uh, unintended behaviors. Uh, state, stated as governable principle in the US DOD's five AI ethical principles. Therefore, we believe it's necessary to have close communications such as the exchange of information and share awareness of issues related to the responsible use of AI among like-minded nations and international partners which share these values. Uh, as I mentioned at the first, at the last Riga conference 2020, um, you know, the AI can, can also be read, AI, AI in Japanese. Uh, AI in Japanese, which means love, L-O-V-E, love. So if you come to Japan and you say AI means love. <coughs> and and it, is, it is with much love that I hope to deepen our mutual understanding of partner nations. So thank you very much and thank you for your kind attention. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I mean, you, you have uh, touched on vital issues here and very, very thorny issues. I mean, getting down and unpacking the issues of fairness, accountability, and transparency, depending on the U.S. Department of Defense for your AI ethics, that raises some issues. And I know that, that I, I just cannot tell you enough in my, my experience over the last six years with AI, starting with the FDOECD, Japan has been a primary force for good in this field. Everything that your country has done has been helpful and right, and, and your involvement in this, in this organization 
is critical, and I, and I, I really appreciate that, and I'm sure all of us all of us do as well. The question that I have coming out of this is, can ethics keep up with the development of this disruptive technology? Because we know that every disruptive technology has unexpected consequences, and I worry very much, as I'm sure all of us do, about the unexpected consequences of artificial intelligence systems. So thank you very much. You've raised really important points. Um, thank you. Um, President Vic Freiberg, um, I think you bring a strong view to this, an international view, and uh, the view from Latvia's expertise. Um, I'm also pleased to say that you took Latvia into the EU and NATO, and I was there at the OECD when we brought Latvia in there, and Latvia has been a strong voice at the OECD, and I really appreciate that. So the floor is yours, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear Governor Dukakis, dear Tom, uh, distinguished panelists uh, and participants, uh, I shall be going over uh, a very broad brush overview of the of the essential concerns I think that face us uh, in connection uh, with a new uh, international accord uh, and the necessity for it. Uh, for inter uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, recently, we have all been living for the past year under a pandemic that has underlined uh, the importance of not just each country being ready for something unexpected and new, uh, but also in collaborating uh, not just with its immediate neighbors, but with the rest of the world on a broader scale. Uh, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations has reminded us of the importance of multilateralism and uh, uh, during my presidency of the Club de Madrid World Leadership Alliance, uh, I was happy to, to participate uh, with uh, Nguyen Tuan uh, in our um, uh, concern about multilateralism. Uh, in this sort of situation. The minister has very uh, importantly underlined that I would say the first concern uh, on the international scene uh, is for the use of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in uh, security, defense uh, and unarmed uh, systems of warfare. Uh, if for a nuclear, the control of nuclear weapons, uh, we have had progress and then retrogress uh, and then some renewed hope uh, recently again. The, the field of artificial intelligence uh, in military applications is probably not ready for international accords and certainly uh, not ready for anything resembling uh, any kind of moratorium on innovation uh, and, and new production. I think this would be uh, uh, a pipe dream uh, for which we, we, we should not even uh, uh, aim for, but rather to have some principles, some ethical principles and some guidelines that should be kept even as the uh, strongest nations on earth will undoubtedly continue. Uh, with their programs uh, in this area. Uh, where uh, think tanks uh, such as and, and, and groups such as ours can intervene are the areas where civil society uh, has usually has had uh, a voice and, and something to say. And this concerns both the administration of each country separately, in other words, what goes on within the country, uh, but also in international uh, affairs, where I think that we would all subscribe uh, to, to the urgent and important need for uh, a new social contract for the AI age, uh, which would again outline uh, the essential uh, ethical principles uh, that should be the overall overarching, very broad, very broad principles mm -hmm. uh, that one should not uh, breach uh, in one's developments. I mean, uh, we will have to go back to Isaac Asimov and, and his laws of robotics and, and, and uh, if nothing else, then say, well, any new uh, AI system uh, should not be um, 
conceived uh, to harm uh, or, or kill human beings. Uh, that sounds crude and, and primitive, but I think most of us would be very happy to see such a universal agreement uh, if it was respected by all. Uh, the, the impact of artificial intelligence has uh, two areas of, of effect in society uh, that already are fragile and under stress from many uh, from many sectors and these are the the general economy uh, and the uh, situation of human rights but human rights uh, not just in the in, in the sense of being protected from the brutality of, of tyrannies but even in what we might call civilized countries uh, human rights in terms of uh, the right to education, the right of access to health, the right of um, dignity, uh, the right to have a job. Someday it is going to be a privilege to have a job. Uh, the right to training, and not just education, but training and retraining. Uh, the right to privacy, which was already mentioned. All of these are matters that I think citizens would like to put before their government. Uh, and where think tanks and intellectuals um, and, and the, the voice of society through various, uh, various uh, civil society activism uh, is able to influence the government and their operation. I might add that thinking about the governance of countries within each country, I can imagine, uh, of course, the harmful effects that might be linked to it, such as uh, job displacement, which would imagine the so many jobs uh, are will go missing so many businesses will disappear just as a result of the current pandemic which is not yet over add to that massive job loss and and displacement of populations uh because of uh, artificial intelligence doing away with the need for human beings uh, to get the job done uh, this could become a, a very, very serious crisis indeed. But on a much smaller case, uh, and, and on, on everyday affairs, uh, we can imagine artificial intelligence being a boon to humanity, of course. Uh, it is a powerful tool, and I, I have visions, of, for instance, of, of it being used uh, in those countries that have an ongoing fight, and very often a losing fight with corruption. Uh, human nature being what it is, and subject to temptations of every kind, as, as the churches and major religions have, have been telling us uh, for the past few thousand years. Um, imagine uh, a world where a lot uh, uh, of what was done by humans and, and would uh, make them liable to take irrational or counterproductive uh, uh, decisions or decisions that are not for the common good but for their personal benefit. Uh, if, if you had AI systems in the place where you, that you couldn't drive and, and hopefully that you couldn't have them so on. So, uh, of course, we are all aware of the fact that any new invention is a double-edged sword. Um, uh, we have to sharpen that sword so that it, uh, uh, it can keep uh, doing uh, it's, it's its job uh, as a tool or a weapon uh, in uh, in defense or in constructing something and building something. Uh, but we also have to be very very concerned about the harmful effects. And uh, I think both both together, of course, and uh, just bringing uh, the I think the awareness and interest of society on something else then. Uh, the immediate concerns that everybody uh, has about the pandemic. Uh, I think it would be a worthwhile contribution uh, by the Boston Global Forum, by the Institute for, for Leadership and Innovation, and, and generally about all of us who are involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. You uh, gave us another tour de table of the, the issues that are there. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea of not addressing the lethal uses of artificial intelligence systems, but I realize that perhaps this group can't do everything. Um, and I think also the last point is interesting about AI systems fighting 
Um, you have to, it, it's very difficult because what you have to do there is make sure you have a system that accounts for bias in the information that's put in, that algorithms are fair and balanced. I mean, that's very difficult. That's one of those very thorny technical issues that's going to require a lot of work on our part, but is, is certainly critical. So thank you very much for, for setting, setting a very high level. Um, and now it's uh, time for Professor Lagobista um, to talk to us about uh, your, your thoughts from, from Sarajevo. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you. Of course, I first want to thank you too. And I mean, who was bringing us here all together. I mean, and so quietly looking at what we are doing today. Uh, of course, I want to thank to my already old friends. I mean, my president, my double president, Vaira, uh, and uh, when her enthusiasm was always be giving me higher spirit and motivating me again, especially, I mean, after speaking, uh, speaking after Vaira, it's very hard to, to say something which can be so, you know, let's say visible. Uh, but uh, I just, uh, of course, Governor Dukakis uh, uh, is a uh, bright force behind this, and I want to thank you. And, and Nasli, I mean, I already know you for such a long time. I mean, that uh, I have a feeling that I knew you for much, much longer time, and every time I hear you, I get some new ideas about how to move forward. Uh, at the same time, I was very eagerly waiting to listen uh, what I already heard and to learn from distinguished panelists' thoughts on the idea that we all want to become reality while reaching for a better and more prosperous world. That is our common goal. Uh, so uh, we have expression like that it is not only about how many ideas any one of us have, but it is about how many of them we ultimately make alive by working uh, together with other stakeholders along shared vision and uh, shared values. So in order to make those ideas alive, uh, we have to work on their refinement, but those endeavors have to be accompanied with the establishing of proper governance structure. Without that uh, governance structure, uh, it's hard to just things expected to be done. Uh, as Nasli was mentioning, multi-stakeholderism and uh, that approach is definitely digital policy, is something that is making us pushing inclusion of stakeholders one step further in direction of establishing and adjusting proper global governance network for artificial intelligence. Uh, let, me, let me remind you that eight, de eight decades ago, physicists were not deciding about what to do with atomic energy. So now computer scientists are not exclusive masters of deciding what to do with their invention. That's a good thing. Or to put it from another perspective, uh, like the war is too serious thing to be left only to generals, the same way artificial intelligence is too serious thing to be left only to computer scientists. So some of us are. A computer scientist, and maybe we sometimes think that every solution is, is in technique, technology, and so on. So uh, it is too serious, but also it's another way around. So having in mind lessons learned from recent history, because I come from the part of the world, we always like to say uh, the history is best teacher, and we always have to learn lessons from the history. And uh, in my part of the world, the only lessons we learn from history is that we don't learn from history any lessons. But some good lessons are, I think, very, very practical ones. I just want to remind you uh, the UN uh, history dealing with atomic energy, because atomic energy and artificial intelligence have very many similarities, of course, differences as well. But I will, uh, with, uh, I will have, give you a few remarks about global governance or artificial intelligence and internet ecosystem for work in life in a context of artificial intelligence international accord that we are now trying to put together and that is requiring faster and more profound actions. So back in January, 46, 1946, UN Atomic Energy Commission was established, founded by resolution number one, number one, of United Nations General Assembly, in order, as they were said, that to deal with the problems raised by discovery of atomic energy. So that commission was established, this band six years later, in 52, because, I mean, uh, it just didn't work. The UN and other nuclear age uh, were born almost simultaneously, uh, the way that the United Nations and artificial intelligence been going through almost simultaneously to the end of this first centennial period of United Nations. What I'm trying to say is that maybe this is the reason why I'm making reference to a landmark address of uh, American President Eisenhower back in '53, when he was saying that atoms for peace should be leading us to the establishment of something which was back in 1957 uh, established as a uh, I, 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 a 
EA or International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. So the, instead of the commission back in 46, IAEA was established in 40, 57 independently of the United Nations, but through its own international treaty. Uh, I think I'm leading somehow to this international accord to something. Uh, so uh, the IA was an uh, international organization that seeks to promote peaceful and uh, prosperous use of nuclear energy and it inhibits its use for any military purpose, including nuclear <laughs> I could say including nuclear weapons, replacement with artificial intelligence. So we can use the same wording. And that, that report both to UN General Assembly and Security Council with membership of over 170 states out of 193 member states. Today, I think we urgently need some kind of leadership call. And I see this as some kind of putting together a voice for establishment of some kind of uh, IA, IA, International Artificial Intelligence Agency. That could be the next step for governing what we call the new AI and Internet ecosystem for work and life in our social contract for the artificial intelligence age. In accordance to some kind of international artificial intelligence international accord that we are creating with while supporting social contract to AI age that we already created a social contract. So I'm just using the same wording, exactly the same wording uh, that UN uses by defining international atomic agency. And we can say with the same wording that IA, IA is the world's central intergovernmental forum for scientific and technical cooperation in the AI field. It works for safe, secure, and peaceful use of IA in digital governance, contributing to the international peace and security in accordance to Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so, Mr. Nakayam, Mr. Minister, he is your human-centered artificial intelligence in this in this in this wording, and of course, to UN SDGs. End of the quote that could lead us to the same conclusion. So the question remains, do we have another 10 years, like six decades ago, when the, it took from the commission to some kind of functioning agency? And International Agency, Atomic, International Atomic Energy Agency history is the perfect reason for reason data. Why do we have to move quickly to global governance of AI and internet ecosystem and to some kind of inclusive international agency artificial intelligence agency in having in mind when i say inclusive i'm talking about multi state approach in that sense so i see today our discussion as our call maybe some kind of call to leaders to show wisdom and leadership using science and technology fruits in order to move our planet in the right direction uh, we have expression i end with that expression if there's a will that there is a way the question is can we create the will that we establish something that will be in charge of what we are talking about according to something which we call Artificial Intelligence International Accord. I'll stop in here, of course. Wow. Well, make no small plans here. Um, <laughs> I, I thought, Otherwise, why are we here? If we have small plans, why are we here? With so many people. I, 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 you're really and, and speaking <laughs> my language here. Andy's laughing as you see him there. Um, I, I, I proposed in 2016 at a meeting in Washington, D.C., sponsored by Microsoft with all of the big tech companies there, I proposed an international treaty on AI similar to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation mm -hmm. Treaty. And I was just about laughed out of the room or booed out of the room. The only person who agreed mm -hmm. with me was Mark Rotenberg. But I still, I, I think this is a brilliant idea. It's a huge goal. and. Whether we get to that end or not, the means of trying to get there strike me as a worthy cause here. So, so that's that's music to my ears. I don't know how the rest of you feel about that, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, I'll turn now to um, Mayor of Hickok um, to talk to us about what we can and can't do here. Um, so, Mayor, thank you very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Doc, and it's an absolute honor to be here today, and I'll echo you. It's music to my ears as well. Uh, I would like to contribute to today's discussions with both the AI ethics and governance and AI policy hats that I'm wearing and focus on how these elements interact with each other when we're looking at uh, state and non-state actors. Social Contract 2020 is grounded in the idea that AI should protect fundamental rights and systems are implemented in a transparent and accountable way. 
and they're considered from a multi-stake perspective to achieve fair and equitable global community. Hence, it's very critical for us to talk about how we can cooperate with governments to align policy and priorities with these ethical principles and build alliances around this. But at the same time, how we can hold government industry complex accountable and how we can contribute to a truly global effort and amplify the less visible voices. Um, a couple of months ago, our team at Center for, Center for AI and Digital Policy, working under the auspices of the Michael Dukakis Institute, and in collaboration with AI World Society and Boston Global Forum, we have published the AI and Democratic Values AI Social Contract 2020 Index Report. Uh, it is the first of its kind, uh, comparative report on national AI policies and practices. Uh, we looked at 30 countries for their endorsement of OECD AI principles, human rights conventions, um, social contract for the AI age, and compared what those endorsements look like when it came to implementations. Um, we found that the nations have, all these nations that ha have very ambitious plans and significant gaps between the written commitments and the actual implementation. That there were red lines for AI and that uh, that had significant negative impacts on individuals and communities. That civil society is a crucial actor in holding actors accountable and enacting change. In the course of research, uh, we also realized that uh, there is currently no tool available that continuously monitors the country implementations. I know a lot of you are familiar with OECD AI Observatory, which came the closest, uh, but there, there is definitely uh, was a vacuum there. As a team, we also had a concern. Although we had accomplished this incredible feat of comparing 30 countries, 25 by GDP, and five impact countries in AI like Singapore and Rwanda, we acknowledged the fact that the representation of Global South uh, countries was not enough and we committed for 2021 we committed to expanding our coverage as well as monitoring uh, significant AI policy developments in these regions. Um, similar concerns and findings were also reflected in, in a work I did a few months ago looking at the lessons learned uh, from the numerous AI ethics principles that are in circulation today. I believe the number is somewhere around 200. Uh, what I saw worried me a lot, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so committed to the discussion today, here and onwards. Looking at the geographic distribution of these principles, US, UK, uh, EU countries and their respective institutions made up around 67% of the principles. Uh, Japan represented about 5%. Uh, UAE, India, Singapore, South Korea, and Australia collectively came up to 6%. However, African, South, South and uh, Central American, and Central Asian countries, with the exception of India, were not represented at all uh, independently from the international and supranational organizations like OECD or UNESCO. Uh, so when we say global, uh, it really needs, needs to reflect, also needs to reflect the uh, uh, ethical perspectives, community involvement, uh, so social and historical contexts from, uh, from these regions as well. As mentioned, uh, social contract also looks to gold, uh, hold governments and companies accountable. If the goal is scientific advancement and improved public welfare, collaborative efforts between these entities uh, are beneficial. However, looking at uh, technology companies embedding themselves in public, uh, public services today, a government, index, government industry complex, as Privacy International calls them, you see private companies being used for intelligence management, for policing, justice system, welfare, uh, education, just to name a few. These are what we call high stake domains. However, we never actually sat down and had this public um, public debate around whether this system should be there in the first place, if they could, what the guardrails should be, or what should be the motivation for these systems. Uh, why is this important? I, I want to quote President von der Leyen, uh, 
of here. We need to remember the government's first and foremost responsibility is to protect individuals from harm, serve their rights, and move their welfare forward. Such public and private embeddings can blur the line of accountability and public interest. It shifts the priority uh, from well-being to surveillance or, 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 or other, other similar motives. It puts human rights uh, of the poorest and most vulnerable at risk. In essence, uh, what I want to say, what I'm, I'm trying to say and what it boils down to is global representation, accountability and protection of democratic values cannot be taken for granted. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I think particularly the issue of global inclusion that you've raised again, as others have mentioned, is vital. Um, when you talk about there, the lack of a tool to monitor AI compliance by governments, I mean, there's even a larger gap when it comes to monitoring compliance by the tech giants. And I think yeah. that's a difficult thing to tackle, but I, I appreciate all the issues you've raised. Now, I'd like to use my moderator's prerogative here to put um, Andy Wyckoff on the spot. Andy's the guy there with the bald head. Um, he's the head of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Directorate at the OECD. He's the godfather of the OECD principles on AI. And we worked together for a year and a half to put those principles together. And then it was, it was a difficult and long road, but I think the world has recognized that the OECD's work on this is a benchmark, is a foundation for all the other organizations that are looking at this going forward. So I wonder, Andy, if you could just give us a, a few sentences, and I apologize for putting you on, your, on the spot, but give us a few sentences on, on how that worked and where you see the efforts you've heard about today fitting in to that, to that global community. Well, thank you, Doug, and it's really a pleasure to join this group. I just came to lurk and to learn, to tell you the truth, and to hear some of the constructive criticism about what's going on at the international level, including at the OECD. Um, but just quickly, because I still consider you my boss, Doug, I feel a, a duty to respond to you. Um, uh, we have many um, limitations at, at the OECD. Yes. Our, our mandate doesn't allow us to go to the military or the security that's left with NATO, and that's an important gap, as you talked about. Uh, we have a very limited, which we're trying to fix, a uh, multi-stakeholder model that doesn't do a very good job with reaching out to disadvantaged populations or unfranchised or to parts of the world that I think are really important for AI, such as Africa, which we currently don't have a single member from, from Africa. That's the bad news. The, the, the good news is I've got, a, and Doug knows them, a really good motivated team and a lot of the, uh, the OECD membership pulling very hard behind us. So just very quickly in a couple of sentences, to Doug, um, we are trying to move towards really practical tools, uh, classifications that try to differentiate different types of AI and clear, provide more of a evidence base underneath these different types of AI so we can have a variegated policy approach, which I think is, is badly needed. Um, we're also doing um, a fair amount of uh, outreach now to other groups. You're aware of the observatory, which I'm very happy about. And just, just to conclude, um, there's the embryonic global partnership on AI, which was launched last year, led by Canada and France. It quickly had 15 founding members. And there's quite a queue now to come in, Doug. And what I like best about this group is it, it looks at some of the issues you were talking about, like trying to, how to get bias out of data in a very technical but operational way. Uh, and it is engaging with the platforms, as is one, our expert group. But you're right. Uh, currently, we have no really hard accountability or um, audit type function uh, in existence to my knowledge. But again, thank you for the invitation today. And I didn't mean to speak, but I, I, I'm very happy to hear uh, the dialogue. Thank you, Andy, and my apologies. And 
it's heartening because nobody believes I'm their boss anymore. Um, I, I'd like to just ask a broad question of the group and each of you may respond or not. Um, but if you are responding, unmute. If you're, if you're not responding, um, mute yourself, unmute yourself and then, then come back in. And that is, you know, one of the issues that's, that's raised here, and I, I confess to my, my favoritism toward it, is the idea of the end goal being some kind of international binding treaty, like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. I've spent many, many years working on nuclear issues as a journalist and spent a lot of time at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. And so that's one of the reasons this has such enormous appeal to me. But um, I, I wonder what the rest of you, particularly those of you who have been in politics and understand the difficulties in bringing policies into practical effect, um, what, what, how you feel about this issue. So I'll just open the floor and see if that, and then when others have any kind of comments, obviously make them please. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Okay, may I? Sure. Thank you, sir. Um, frankly speaking, um, uh, Michael Dukakis-san made a comment at the beginning about the Cold War. Uh, and the, Michael-san talked about the 20th century Cold War. But I think uh, the 21st century Cold War uh, exists uh, inside of the internet layer. And uh, if I attend a conference uh, held that in United States, held that in Europe about uh, AI society or the internet um, moral or issue. And um, I can clearly can see there is uh, some collaboration uh, between the country. Uh, I can see Rus Russia, former Soviet Union, and also the China always collaborating together. And they are talk about how to manage and how to control and how to make a limitation uh, inside of the internet layer. So they want to control the people, not freedom inside of the internet layer. But uh, uh, 180 degree opposition is United States and all the democratic country who attend the conference uh, from all over the world. Of course, us, that uh, we, the Japan also, uh, we think the internet field and the internet layer is for the, uh, how to say, to make a good influence and also the to make a growth of economy or the businesses. So United States and Japan and the, all the democratic country uh, believe in freedom inside of the internet and not controlled by the government or how do you say uh, so now uh, you can see when you look at the myanmar when you look at the uh, burma uh, the the military uh, government they stop internet or they control uh, to make stopping the uh, like um, uh, arab springs kind of uh, mm -hmm. movements so uh, I'm really worried about the uh, 21st century Cold War inside of the internet layer is uh, as a polit as a one politician, honestly speaking, I'm uh, how it's going to be in the future for our kids age. I mean, the, uh, my son or my daughter, when she when she or he grew up, he be they became adult. Uh, what what the collaboration between the two two sides, uh, free uh, free and the democratic side versus communist and socialist side? It's going to be very big uh, divide. Uh, how do you say decoupling? is going to be appear. So this is my concern. And also, if there is some opinion or advice to me, uh, please give me an advice. And also the. All the all the armament will going to become unmanned 
fighter jet, unmanned, of course, you know, the equipment, or but only one click can destroy everything. Only one click. If he he or she has a good tech, he good tech. Uh, it's like uh, buying a Coke on uh, from the vendor. If you one click, you can destroy nation. So this will become a big change. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Can I just add something? Please go ahead. Uh, Vera, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I I would like to to continue on the on the psychological impacts of artificial intelligence, where they bleed into, or in fact, they fill out from uh, general uh, information uh, handling uh, programs and, and possibilities. Uh, so much of of cyber warfare that is already going on, and that many countries have felt as direct attacks on their on their systems both of defense and governance generally uh, we have had cyber warfare uh, incidents uh, and quite serious ones already in the past but what uh, i think we should be turning our attention to and this is much more subtle and more difficult to pinpoint is the manipulation of cloud and the manipulation of public opinion uh, by playing uh, on uh, the weaknesses uh, in human character. And this is where uh, I, I, I think that uh, Russia has developed um, uh, a tradition. Uh, they, they did not have psychology as, as we know it in the West, but they did have uh, studies uh, about how best to manipulate uh, human minds uh, and control them. Uh, Stalin, of course, had a very simple tool in that was fear and terror. Uh, and, and still works for many, many dictators. But nowadays we have, we see it in the United States, and I think the, the sort of things that uh, Governor uh, Dukakis was uh, referring to, uh, the movements uh, in uh, really traditionally well-established democracies uh, of long-standing, uh, movements uh, of, of irrationality, uh, movements of following lies rather than information, uh, the inability to distinguish truth from fiction, and in fact an emotional desire, uh, I would say that these, uh, there are deliberate efforts, there are deliberate programs that play on the infantile needs uh, that many people have about somebody taking them by the hand, leading them uh, uh, protecting them from enemies, uh, the the things that are wrong in their life, uh, finger pointing at somebody who's to blame for it, and I will remove these threats and and uh, and will uh, help you and so on. Uh, these are elementary, simple manipulations, but extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily difficult. And uh, uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of of research going on. Um, uh, both open and and not so open, uh, also uh, in in free and democratic countries. But definitely, uh, the the science of manipulating minds and creating creating chaos in society, distrust in governments, distrust in the democratic processes, distrust in uh, in solidarity. Those are going on in a very systematic way. And they uh, should be studied, I think, more uh, seriously and more broadly. I'd like to agree. I'd like to agree with the president on this. Uh, we've just come through a very difficult presidential election, as all of you know, uh, in which the loser, uh, who was the incumbent president at the time. Uh, did everything he could to try to convince people that uh, that was a flawed election. He was lying. That was probably the best run election I've ever experienced in my life. And yet there was enormous amount of disinformation, uh, outright falsehoods, uh, 
which continued, as all of you probably observed, right up until the moment when Biden was finally officially elected <laughs> president of the United States. Um, so I'm not sure I buy the notion that, well, we've got these democratic countries over here who are doing things right. And then we've got these non-democratic countries over here that aren't doing it. Uh, believe me, as what I hope is a democratic country, we've come through an election where uh, disinformation uh, continued, so much so that a significant number of members of the Congress of the United States voted to disallow that election with no basis for doing so. And frankly, uh, we need the help of the international community, as do what we might argue are non-democratic countries, to see if we can't find a way through this. But it was like no election I've experienced, um, even though Biden won by seven million votes. So we need help as well as a democratic country to see if we can find our way through this very different, very new, and very troubling state of affairs, which I regret to say probably is going to continue in one way or another, uh, even with a new president. And uh, we're seeing that already in the aftermath of what happened here. So uh, believe me, we need your help and your <laughs> involvement and the involvement of the national community uh, in helping us to work through this process. And uh, it's an extremely troubling state of affairs, believe me, as somebody who's been a practitioner, if you will, all his life, believes deeply in the system, but um, was, like millions of Americans, extremely troubled by what we experienced post-election until the matter was finally resolved. And there are still millions of Americans who have bought the notion that it was an unfair election, that it was stolen. All of this was false. Uh, all of this sadly was encouraged by the defeated candidate and his supporters. But uh, we are not, uh, we're not immune from, from having to deal with the state of affairs in part because of this new technology, which gives people an opportunity to uh, spread ideas far and wide, which in fact were absolutely false. Um, we all need guidance here. And so I see this as, as uh, an opportunity for us to bring the international community together and to ask it, all of you, to be part of a thinking process which will make it possible for us to avoid what we've just gone through. Believe me, it was very, very troubling. Very troubling, even for those of us who are strongly committed to democracy. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think um, international collaboration uh, is going to be so important if we're going to deal with this set of problems. And uh, we need lots of help, believe me, from you and from the international community. Can I follow up on this, please? Of course. Yes, by all means. So, so I'd like to react very quickly to what has been said so far, because really important on the issue of emotion. Um, AI has begun to look at emotion. There's a book by a colleague of mine who's passed away, Minsky, on the emotion machine. Um, very important, very powerful. It's not fun reading. 
um, it's kind of painful reading, but it, it gives a sense of, of where the, the AI thinking has been uh, has been uh, based. My second point is on the Cold War of the 21st century. I totally agree that in the internet domain, this is alive and well and going very fast. What is really interesting is if you look at the logistics, the technology of the internet and ask where are the control points, exactly who controls what. Um, there's a book that just came out last year with a computer scientist and, and myself on that. Who puts the fingers what? It becomes much more complicated. It doesn't deny at all what has been said a moment ago on the 21st century a Cold War, but it gives us clues as to how to begin to think about it in operational terms. And then finally, on, on the matter of the agency, I have two, two, two future agency uh, that has been proposed. I have two, two uh, views on this, uh, two aspects of this that are important. One is building on precedent. This is exactly what the argument was. Uh, it can be very, very powerful. That's a positive side. Negative side is that, not of precedent or of the idea, is that I can see uh, some countries arguing that AI, IT, well, the IT, you should take that over. Uh, that would not be a terrific idea. Uh, this is not a domain that could be turned over to, to, the, to the ITU. So in a sense, we're anticipating where some of the dilemmas might come from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Please. Uh, well, uh, uh, just a few reflections. Um, if we want, uh, obviously, we are confronted with a dilemma how we will would lead the changes that are needed as a result of uh, artificial intelligence growth. And the way we started was the defining social contract. Now, the next step would be accord, some kind of norms, how we do it. And of course, the the last point is, what are the all those multi-stakeholders, how they would be somehow governed on a global scale? So that's how we came to that idea. It's not a new idea, of course, about ag that agency. I personally think that that if we have, you know, if everyone is in charge, then usually no one is in charge. So if everyone is in charge of all these things being done, then no one ultimately will be in charge of what is supposed to be done. Now, uh, the first, if we want to move, let's say, people who are decision makers, people who were presidents, prime minister, kings, whoever, I mean, leaders, leaders in, in sitting leaders, there are two ways how you move those people. You move them because uh, you go for something uh, that is along with their programs and their ideas and what they want to do in order to change the world. That's one way. Another way is they are moved by the pressure done from the bottom up and from the pressure that is coming from environment. So what we have to do is we have to create some kind of pressure, if I can put it this way. What is the, the first step in creating, in leading change is not having a vision and having guiding coalition that will go for it. The first step is that in creating awareness of the, of the uh, fears and hopes that are around us on certain matter and sense of urgency that it has to be tackled quickly. So what I think that we should do, how I see us as, a, as alliance of uh, like-minded people, entities, that we should uh, be including as many people in order to create awareness and a sense of urgency along the big vision, because you will not move decision makers by just telling them what to do. You have to give them why, and that why is a big fear or big hope. So we have both uh, elements when we talk about artificial intelligence. There are fears and there are hopes as well. So in that context, I think that it is very important that we create some kind of, as an alliance of like-minded people, to create awareness of and sense of urgency that time has to be done. The second point is, uh, uh, I completely agree. I mean, that the cold, uh, the problem is that the Cold War is replaced with, as some people say, Cold War. So we have Cold War. But uh, what uh, what uh, Mr. Nakayama was talking about, I mean, we are talking about Cold War because the war was done either by dictators, by autocrats, by technocrats or Democrats if they attacked. But the war is Cold War can be uh, now driven by uh, algocracy. 
or maybe because algorithms to a certain extent we already have situations with algorithms are making decisions uh and the next either more dangerous but also tempting stage is when we have a cold war getting into the real war driven by uh artificiocracy artificiocracy artificial intelligence because on the end of the day the days of herbert simon back in 60s was saying that technology is nothing there's no moral about technology it's about technology it's about extending our potentials but on the end of the day it's a moral of the people it's the purpose of technology is it are we good or bad people on the end of the day our artificial intelligence may get out of the hands that it's not about how good or bad we are it's how good or bad is the creature creation that we may end with and especially uh, if that go in that direction so uh, i think that uh, how i see this our 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 gathering and our serious gatherings is uh, some kind of uh, uh, call for different actions on putting uh, positive pressure on decision makers and on people in different areas all those multi stakeholders that we are talking about to be some kind of big family of people who realize that we have to do something and we have to do it quickly because at the end of the day it looks for me that we are in race against time and in race against ourselves because on the end of the day as, as hawking says with stephen hawking one of his last words of artificial intelligence but it is great thing as far as it has the same goals like us the question is i mean who is us and uh, we are creating technology that may have have a goal not given by algorithm by given by something else so that's why we have to go back to the U un convention of human rights declaration of human rights why we have to go back on human-centered artificial intelligence and those things to, to to let's say push them in different ways i'll stop it here well that's brilliant creating pressure is the only way to make this happen but it's it's very difficult because of the, the forces against which we're fighting. I mean, Governor Dukakis was talking about Trump and his disinformation. Trump is in kindergarten compared with Putin and his professionalism, the way they use technology to, to, to sell lies, as we saw in the Ukraine, as we've seen in, in the Baltic states and many other places. Um, you know, so this is, this is a call to action that is, is really vital. Um, we're running We've got about 10 minutes left, but there are, are many things to talk about. So who else has an issue or who wants to talk about what we've discussed? Mayor, please. Thanks, Doug. I, I want to pull some of the strings together. And um, I also collaborate with a number of international standard setting and governance setting organizations uh, like IEEE, uh, IEC. And one of the things that we're trying to create is the standards and the frameworks to international standards and frameworks for AI systems and autonomous systems. Um, what you see uh, here in, in reality is very much what uh, Minister Nakayama said, that there is already an existing, um, not, not maybe polarization, but group groupings uh, of uh, of countries within this international standard setting bodies, because eventually that translates into what kind of products are sold, what kind of products are accepted, what standards are accepted uh, across the globe, which uh, if, uh, you know will have an impact on the economy of these countries. So you're seeing Russia and China having serious uh, representation in one one group and uh, America and European countries or Western countries having serious representation in, in one group and there's there are a lot of clashes around this uh, when you extrapolate that with uh, you know what Putin Putin said about whoever becomes the leader in the sphere will become the ruler of the world uh, suggesting AI and when you combine that with China's Belt and uh, Road initiative of how they're trying to expand this AI and surveillance, AI and surveillance uh, technologies uh, whether it's hardware or software uh, to countries uh, in Africa in Latin America a lot of the autocratic uh, countries uh, regimes uh, you're seeing that this is 
<laughs> this is very in interconnected. It's not like one effort after another. We're already seeing this polarization and it's a very strategically moving, looking at 10, 20 years ahead of, uh, ahead in the future. Uh, so just to, you know, reiterate whatever we do, we need to do it very quick and uh, in, in a collaborative way. Thank you. What are you putting at the screen, Mr. Minister? I'm sorry, it's uh, very bright, but uh, it's a map of the uh, internet cables. I'm sorry, you cannot see because it's too bright. I'm so sorry. But um, I, I personally think that the why Chinese government, uh, they grab the Hong Kong. Because if you look at the Hong Kong, Hong Kong is the one of the, the hub of the internet cables. So they can steal any information from the cable. So internet feels like a, it's kind of like a Wi-Fi. The information is flying over uh, in front of you, but you cannot see. It's a, you know, visually cannot see. But actually the information inside of the cable, it's trafficking. So, you know, the infrastructure of the cable, this is very important. When, when 2014, the Soviet, I mean, the Russian uh, troops uh, occupied uh, Crimea, they cut the line. They attack IXP, Internet Exchange Point. So how can we not just managing the information or content, but also we have to protect the infrastructure itself. So if the present internet layer is dirty, getting black, we have to make another layer, very secure, white layer. Maybe in the future, we, we have to make uh, new layers. This is going to be uh, the, the, the change the game and uh, solve the issue, I guess. And uh, this new layer, have to become, uh, you have to show the ID, you have to, you know, identify yourself and pay for the infrastructure. And uh, that is the only solution. If you'd like to, if we would like to uh, change the internet, internet world. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to clean up the present internet. So can I follow up on this, this exact point? Very quickly, I totally agree, but I would add to it uh, reviewing the gateway protocol. Uh, this is really quite important because that is rerouting of where it goes, where the stuff goes. And then certification, the, the, the certificate uh, authorities we have as a system for is terrible. And who certifies the certifiers? We don't have that. So, so this is not this. Is, my purpose is not to critique the internet, simply to to, to reinforce uh, the the layers that are essential to be looked at again, over and above the physicality. Uh, it has to do with the rules of the game that were put in place, and the absence of of governance for those that are supposed to be governing the certification. So. We have just a small task in front of us here, obviously. Um, we, we are near the end, and I will sum up very briefly, but I wonder, Governor Dukakis, do you have some, some thoughts on what, what you've so patiently listened to today? Um, it just tells us that we've got a, a, a lot of issues out there that uh, we're going to have to try to deal with. Um, and let me just add one additional thing, which is that... Um, you know, we're, we're dealing now, and I suspect many of you are, but we're dealing with the whole question of uh, who limits what goes out there. Um, you know, do we let private actors decide what will or will not go through their networks? Um, it's a whole new issue for us, and I'm sure for the world as a whole. So. Uh, all I can say is that um, we're, we're dealing with, 
with uh, a whole set of problems. Um, as a number of you have said, we've got to move on this quite quickly. We haven't got a lot of time to sit around, and uh, and I hope we can do so. I hope we can do so. There's got to be a sense of urgency here. Yes, indeed, there is. Um, if you go back and look at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, nuclear weapons take a long time to develop. The, I the IAEA had some time to get things up and running, but artificial intelligence systems <laughs> are better than we can go. I mean, it's just, it's, it, the task is urgent and the task is, is huge, frankly. I, I, I have sort of two elements have emerged from this very interesting and, and eclectic conversation in my mind. And one is that we need the coordinated action of a critical mass of democracies, starting with the EU and the US and ASEAN and the IGOs and NGOs, we need to move forward and we need to have the private sector at the table as well. And we need mm -hmm. to have the global south. So we need this coordinated action of a critical mass. Second thing is that this process of ours is, is gonna be very difficult. Frankly, the hard part here is to distill coherent policies, real world policies from a huge body of research a debate and divisions and bringing those, healing those divisions. It, it may be too late. We may be too far down the road on the Cold War. It's very difficult to imagine Russia and China sitting down to come up with guidelines for dealing with artificial intelligence systems going forward. And it's equally hard to imagine them adhering to them. But the, the, the other side of that coin is, what good are they if they don't adhere to them? What good are they if we can't get the Chinese to the table and the Russians to the table to talk about this? So I, I think that we have started a, a fascinating and very difficult conversation here. And the key points that have come out um, that Tuan is gonna have to distill himself <laughs> for, the next, for the next panel are, are really valuable. Um, so that's, that's what I have to close on. It's 11.30 my time. Uh, I, I think it's, it's the time to close. Is it, if it, but if anyone else has, has final words, um, I think that we would all benefit from them. Please, please, Mr. Thank you. Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, I, think, I think AI, existing internet is, uh, I think the, you know, the internet is kind of like a Pandora's box. <laughs> so what is, what is the left? inside of the Pandra's box. It's only one, hope. So hope is uh, our, you know, answer tonight. I, I mean, the, this morning. So we have to have to grab the hope. And uh, we together make strengthening to go forward, mm -hmm. never lose. And uh, also you, some of you already get the vaccination we have to fight against coronavirus also. So we have to cross a lot. <laughs> so we need the challenge, but we never lose hope. So be strong. I think that's a grand <laughs> note, a grand note on which to end. And I thank you very much. And this, this discussion has been fascinating. So thanks to all of you. It's just terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful okay. panel. Thank you so much. Wonderful panel. We see. Good night. Good night. Good. Be in touch. <laughs> Good night. Be in touch. <laughs> yes. Thank you. If, if, if Corona over, I would like to go and visit uh, the United States <laughs> or Latvia, <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love to travel. And the please come to. Bring up for the conference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Thank Tuan. You. Bring yeah. us together. Tuan, bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you so Have much. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye, Tuan. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.